Hello, everyone. So today I'll start my talk with a fun fact. Pathology is a word that comes from uh, the Greek language, and it, uh, it's a direct translation is the study of suffering. But in today's context, it better translates to the study of disease, which nicely coincides with MSK's uh, mission, which is to eliminate suffering from uh, cancer. Okay, so this brings me to my first slide. And here I'm showing a pathology slide of uh, a breast biopsy. Here we can see both the presence of uh, ductal carcinomas in situ and invasive cancer cells. And this is a prime example of how pathology is crucial in the identification and classification of cancer, historically guiding almost every decision point in the cancer treatment process. However, pathology alone is not enough in attaining the goal, which is uh, precision oncology. And that's where two more um, molecular profiling assays come into play. MSK Impact is one of those uh, two more molecular profiling assays. And MSK Impact stands for Integrated Mutation Profiling of Actionable Cancer Targets. And it's a high-throughput targeted tumor sequencing test. And it's one of its kind in the sense that both the normal and tumor samples are sequenced at the same time from the same patient so that we can confidently call both uh, germline and somatic mutations. Uh, currently, MSK Impact targets 505 genes with DNA probes capturing mutations in both rare and common cancers. Importantly, MSK Impact has been uh, approved by the NY State Department of Health as a clinical test. And in 2017, it was the first uh, tumor profiling laboratory developed test authorized by the FDA, paving the way for other sequencing um, tests to be used in the clinic. Okay, so here's a brief overview of the MSK Impact Clinical Workflow, and I must uh, make a note here that this is run by the Molecular Pathology and Diagnostics Lab uh, at MSK, whereas uh, Integrated Genomics Operation, where I'm based, we run MSK Impact just for research purposes only. Okay, so step one is getting patient consent. Uh, the patient consents for their samples to be collected and sequenced, and also for the de-identified information to be shared amongst MSK investigators. Uh, step two is collection of the tumor and also blood samples, which is the normal. And then Illumina DNA libraries are prepared by a capture hybridization assay. The libraries are then sequenced and a custom data analysis pipeline is used to call uh, mutations, including copy number variations, gene rearrangements, and it also informs on microsatellite instability. Uh, the results are then manually reviewed for accuracy and quality, and uh, they are uploaded onto MSK-generated databases uh, for clinical trial matching, most importantly. And uh, for this talk, the most relevant one is CBioPortal, where the de-identified information including the genomic mutations, the therapy that the patients are on, and also response to therapy are available uh, for data mining and interpretation. Uh, notably, out of the thousands of MSK patients that participated in MSK Impact, 17% of them harbored germline mutations. And why are these mutations of unique significance? It's because they have major health implications for patients and their families. So detection of uh, pathogenic germline variants is very important, allowing risk reduction uh, of cancer. So it can allow chemo prevention, preventative surgery to take place, and uh, it can also enhance cancer surveillance. Uh, next, detection of pathogenic germline variants is important because it enables genetic counseling, again, for patients and their families, and it can impact eligibility for clinical trials and also speed up the recruitment process. Uh, it also impacts the use of targeted therapies in the clinic. For example, if a patient has a BRCA1 mutation, they will immediately uh, administer with PARP inhibitors. 
Okay, so this brings me to our project aim, which is to benchmark adaptive sampling, uh, long read sequencing for the detection of these germline mutations against prior MSK impact profiles, which are generated by hybridization short uh, read uh, sequencing. And uh, why has adaptive, why is adaptive sampling uh, an attractive technology for us to explore? There are several reasons, and uh, this includes reduced technical complexity, which leads to reduced turnaround times, and there's no need for sample uh, batching. So even if you have one sample, you can go ahead and run adaptive sampling and get your result without being wasteful. Um, additionally, Nanopore technology provides a fully integrated analysis software, starting from base calling to alignment to uh, the variant calling. And due to the long read nature of this assay, it is easier to resolve uh, large complex structural variants, like Mathilde said, tandem duplications, and also insertion of repetitive retrotransposon retro elements. Uh, so what is adaptive sampling? Just quickly, it's a software-based target enrichment method. All you need is your extracted DNA, uh, your target list in a bed file format, and of course your reference genome in a FASTA file. Uh, and due to the live base calling capacity of the nanopore technology, when a fragment makes it to the pore, the, the software can make a decision whether the first about 800 bases are a match with your bed file. If they are, the fragment will be sequenced fully. But if they're not, then uh, the fragment will be ejected and rejected. So sequencing will stop happening for that fragment. OK, so here I'm showing the um, hybridization capture workflow as a comparison. It starts with DNA extraction. Then there is uh, library preparation and uh, goes to hybridization capture overnight. There is a PCR going on, a pooling, QCing, sequencing, and finally data analysis. Uh, whereas adaptive sampling, again, it includes DNA extraction and DNA library preparation, then we have sequencing and data analysis. So you can clearly see from here that the adaptive sampling workflow is much shorter. And this is down to these three steps that are basically the DNA library preparation that are cut down to just one single step just before, just because the hybridization capture happens during sequencing on the instrument instead of on the, on the bench. Okay, so in total from DNA extraction to data, currently on a routine basis, it takes us three and a half days. And I'll just go into more detail for each specific step. We have first the DNA extraction, and we use the MSK impact banked blood samples that were previously collected from consented uh, solid tumor patients. And uh, these are known to harbor germline mutations, uh, or they have phenotypes suggestive of homologous repair, recombination, gene inactivation. We QC the DNA, and we also fragment it down to 15 KB, which is our target length. Uh, next, we prepare the library. Currently, we're using the LSK114 uh, kit, and our input mass is one microgram. And then we QC the library, which is ready for the sequencing. Before we hit the sequencers, though, we make sure that our bed file and the FASTA file reference are ready for uploading. Uh, currently, we use the MSK Impact 505 genes plus three housekeeping genes, just in case we have to control for copy number variation. And uh, we add a 20 KB buffer region upstream and downstream of each gene, just to make sure that we're not going to lose any piece of our uh, genes. Uh, this, in total, targets 2.4% of the genome. Uh, and now it's sequencing time. We load about 80 femtimo, and we do one sample per promethane flow cell, and we only run it for 24 hours, and the uh, base calling option is turned off for computing efficiency reasons. 
Okay, so this brings me to my, our data analysis pipeline, and this is where we started, and I'll just say how it evolved in the next uh, slides. So we filtered the raw pod 5 files based on the on-target decision, which is called stop receiving. And uh, then we do on instrument base calling using our super accurate, um, uh, using the super accurate base caller model. There is on instrument alignment uh, by min Minimap2 using the GRCH38 as a reference. And then finally, we, we use the epitome human variation workflow to call uh, structural, uh, st structural variants and also single nucleotide variants and small indels. Uh, for the structural variant calling, we subset the calls using the MSK impact targets, which is basically exclusion of all introns except for some cases. And then we end up with the filtered as vehicles. Okay, before I go into the data, I'll just show some QC metrics. And our average N50 is 8.5 kilobases. And uh, the main coverage for the on target reads is just under 30x uh, after 24 hours of sequencing. Uh, here I'm showing target gene enrichment. It's just an example. On the top panel, you can see these are all the raw reads that we get uh, from the sequencer. But when we do the filtering based on the on-target decision, you can see that the enrichment cleans up, and we only get enrichment under the three genes that I'm showing here, which are part of the MSK impact uh, uh, target list. Okay, so now I'm going to show a few examples of um, uh, patients and their mutations, their germline mutations. So here is patient uh, 1925. They have a germline structural variant in BART1 uh, gene, and we know that because this has already been sequenced by the MSK Impact short uh, read workflow. And this is a C bio portal screenshot that you can see that there is. Um, deletion in one of the exons of BARD1. Here is the epitome uh, human variation workflow call, and you can see that is the exact same uh, mutation being picked up. And when we zoom in, we see it's a 300 base uh, pair deletion in exon 9 of BARD1 uh, gene. Next, we have patient 1927. They have a germline single nucleotide variant in this case in check 2 gene. Again, we have the CBIO portal uh, screenshot, and it shows a deletion of a G. And this is, again, a consensus call using adaptive sampling. Uh, next, we have a patient that, in this case, this patient has three different germline mutations. Uh, the first one is a BRCA1, is a single nucleotide variant, is a missense uh, variant. Uh, and you can clearly see it there. The next one is uh, a pathogenic LZTR1 single nucleotide variant. In this case, a deletion causing a frame shift mutation. And then the third um, variant is a structural variant. However, from this, you can see that we didn't call any variants, which uh, was unfortunate. And this is the point where one understands where there are so many papers out there comparing structural variant callers. Uh, because structural variant calling is not an easy business, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, and uh, we had to go back and reassess our SV calling. Uh, pipeline, because you can clearly see from the aligned reads, I don't know if people are IGV savvy, they can clearly see there's probably a mutation right there, and you can see it. It seems that it's a deletion. So we went back and we tested other SV callers, and uh, at this time, we incorporated Severus in our SV calling analysis, and uh, we still use a subset uh, we still use subsetting using the impact target. So again, mostly excluding uh, entrance. So Severus uh, was able to call this uh, five exon deletion. It's a big deletion. It's almost uh, 37 KB 
uh, deletion, and you can clearly see that it just like spans uh, the gene next to it as well. This is another example, is another patient. Uh, they have a pathogenic uh, Paul B2 structural variant, and in this case, is an exon 11 tandem dupli duplication. And we could easily just call it with severs, and you can clearly see it in the aligned reads that uh, there's a tandem duplication right there. Okay, so this is another kind of like complicated case for us uh, using the data analysis pipeline that we came up with. It's a patient with a pathogenic MSH2 structural variant. In this case, this is a four exon deletion. Again, we knew that because we had the MSK impact uh, data. And in this case, uh, the caller called two break endpoints. However, because these break endpoints were within introns, when we did our filtering, we basically missed that. So again, it means that there's still room for improvement for our data analysis pipeline, and we have to go back and maybe revisit um, our filtering of like excluding the introns. Because again, adaptive sampling gives you that information to know exactly where the breakpoints are, because it doesn't just target exons. So again, we shouldn't just exclude that information. Uh, okay, so that uh, brings me to my summary slide. And in total, we have uh, sequenced 15 solid tumor patient blood samples using this uh, uh, new adaptive sampling workflow. And we've reached about a 30x coverage. And currently, we're using the epitome human variation workflow to call SNPs, and we've had 100% consensus with the Illumina data. And for the structural variant, it has been a bit more complicated, and currently we use both Epitome and Severus to call these mutations. And I'm going to say that we had four out of five success because we would have missed those intron breakpoints if we didn't know where the mutation was based on our pipeline. And uh, actually, for me to be here and present this simple-looking summary slide, there has been a lot of optimization going on and uh, a lot of tries and fails based on, OK, should we just do on-instrument analysis? Should we just copy the data? And we found that the fastest way was to take advantage of nanopores um, uh, offerings and use the own instrument base calling, the own instrument alignment, and even own instrument uh, human variation workflow, which is now complemented by other SV callers. OK, so in conclusion here, I'm showing that we got about 94 to 95% consensus between the MSK impact short read data and the adaptive sampling long read data. And uh, this is after 15 samples, but I'm happy to announce today that as of last week, that number has gone up to 25 samples, and the consensus has gone up to about just under 97%. So we are getting better, and we are improving our data analysis uh, pipeline, because the reads are there. It's just we need to better analyze them. Uh, OK, so I am showing that you can indeed use long read adaptive sampling to detect uh, pathogenic germline variants in solid tumor cancer patients. And we can currently do this from sample to variant calls within three and a half days. However, we are trying to do that much faster. Uh, and for the future, we are going to increase our N number and we want to integrate and refine our variant colors to increase our reliability and accuracy. Next, we are hoping to do this much faster. I believe that we can do it within two and a half days if we just bring the extraction and library preparation within a day. And even much faster, we take advantage of the live analysis that happens on the, uh, on the instrument. Uh, third, I must say that we st first started uh, doing this project just because of how easy it is to use nanopore sequencing with not much infrastructure in place. Yes, we have a promethion, but we, you can use uh, kitten reagents 
to actually run this workflow and you can just simply make a bed file and get your reference genome and that's all you need to just run this workflow. So it does make it an attractive technology for other smaller entities with less infrastructure than MSK to run such sequencing assays and provide uh, information to patients. Uh, Importantly, this is a highly customizable assay, so you don't have to use MSK Impact. You can use any gene panel that you desire, and it's very simple. You can either use MSK Impact, just remove a few lines, and get it down to the genes that you seem uh, useful for your research. And uh, lastly, we want to take advantage of the methylation data uh, that comes for free with nanopore sequencing, so we do have that in mind to analyze that data in the future. Okay, so with that, I want to acknowledge, of course, MSK uh, Research Support Fund for this, uh, for this work, and uh, of course, the Integrated Genomics Operation Core Facility, where I work, and special thank yous to Trishala. She has been the pipetting hands from sample to, uh, to the end. And also Suiji, she's our data analyst, so she was able to put this pipeline together and uh, together we have been testing all the different uh, analysis parameters. Uh, of course, Jen, she's been the first one who ever ran adaptive sampling at IGO and she has been instrumental in optimizing adaptive sampling uh, in the lab. Uh, Cassidy, uh, they are there, our scientific liaison and of course she's been there's been a bridge between um, our collaborators and our users. And of course, our director, Neiman, uh, she's here. Great support, uh, uh, great support. And also, thank you for bringing all the right people under her roof and making this project uh, possible. And our collaborators, Diagnostics uh, Molecular, from Diagnostics Molecular Genetics, Diana and Ozgi, they provide the samples for us to process and run. Okay, and with that, thank you all for the attention. Thank you, Nanopore, for bringing me here and sharing our research uh, with you.